let's get started in the oral cavity. Before we can talk about the structures that we're going to find in the oral cavity, it's helpful to have a sense of where exactly, where exactly is this oral cavity you speak of. So the oral cavity is inferior to both the hard palate, which is bone, and you can feel that at the roof of your mouth. You can feel a hard, bony structure. That's part of your skull. Your teeth are embedded in your hard palate. And there's also, if you go far enough back, there's a soft palate that's tissuey. You can kind of feel it. I can feel the place where my hard palate turns into soft palate. So my tongue can actually reach all the way back there and feel that. And then your soft palate actually turns into this fantastic structure, which is basically a wiggly little wormy extension of your soft palate. We got to put the name of this thing down here. It's the uvula. And I'll go ahead and write hard palate here as well so we have perspective about where we are. Your oral cavity is the entire space. Check this out. These are your teeth. This is your mandible. What? That's a bone. What is this giant structure that looks like Elvis's hair? It does. I know that this is shocking. That's his tongue. Look at all those muscles in there, all attached to the mandible. Really? That's fantastic. And this is whatever that space is between your mandible bones that you can kind of go. Yo, 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 yo. We're going to talk about all those muscles that control that kind of movement that you can make. This, what was our whole point? Our whole point was to say, what is this oral cavity you speak of? All of this, look at it. All of that is oral cavity. What's farther back? We're going to get into some pharynxes, and we'll talk about the pharynxes in the next chunk. But right now, all we're going to look at is the structures that are found just in that oral cavity. This is because this is a lip, a lower lip and an upper lip. Again, you orient yourself to this section, and we've got our teeth in there. Um, there's a space in between your lower lip and your mandible, which is holding your teeth, and that space right here is called the vestibule. Seriously? You will see that we actually have lots of different vestibules. Vestibules. It's kind of interesting. As we proceed, we will see more vestibules. Let's see if there's anything else I need to tell you from this image. This is where we're focusing now. There are two structures that we're going to look at in a little more detail, and they play different roles in digestive processes. Digestion does happen in the mouth. And do you remember the two kinds of digestion that we can have? Remember, we can have mechanical digestion and chemical. And mechanical digestion in your mouth happens because of who? Your teeth, dogs, and chemical digestion. Really? There are chemicals being added into your mouth that are digesting your food? Indeed, it is so. Your saliva contains digestive enzymes. Okay, it contains one digestive enzyme called salivary amylase that breaks down starch. And so chemical digestion actually begins in your mouth. There are three pairs of salivary glands that contribute saliva, and we're going to look at those guys. I think first on my list is to look at teeth. So let's check out that. That's actually kind of a nice image of teeth. See it? <laughs> this is actually the direction I meant to go because I want to talk about our different kinds of teeth and how many we have and how to tell them apart, distinguishing features of our teeth. So look, my friends, 
a baby. A baby has, um, what are they called? What are they called? They are um, baby, no, they have a name, deciduous teeth, like deciduous trees, deciduous teeth. And babies ha have, ultimately, they're going to erupt in glorious fun times when the eruptions start happening. They're going to end up with 20 deciduous teeth or baby teeth or milk teeth. And I'm going to show you what those teeth are. Now, orient yourself here. This is an upper jaw or an upper maxilla. This is the lower jaw or the mandible. And we have two sides. And so you, you got to know that we just laid out all these teeth so that you can see the whole thing. But this is the midline. Like if I drew a line down the whole thing, that's my midline. So teeth on this side are assuming this is, we won't even talk about right and left because I actually don't know which one is supposed to be which. Is this anatomical position or what? But one side, these would be like all of the ones on your right or left, and this would be all the ones on the other side. You follow what I mean, right? Left? <laughs> okay. So we have two incisors that are um, lining the medial aspect of your teeth. These guys right here are your incisors. Incisors are for chopping. This is the medial incisor. This is a lateral incisor. All told, you have four incisors on the bottom, and you have four incisors on the top. I, when I'm counting teeth, when I'm looking at a skull and trying to identify what tooth we're talking about, I start in the midline. I know that the two teeth lateral to the midline are going to be incisors, and I basically count from there. The next friendly tooth in line is actually called a canine tooth. And canine teeth, you've got two on the bottom and two on the top. And these guys are puncturing teeth. They're sharper than incisors. Incisors are kind of chisel-like, so they're for ripping and tearing. And canines are for puncturing and hanging on to stuff. Then we start getting into our molars. Now this is a place where it gets a little bit interesting because you notice that the white teeth on top, those are my baby teeth, but look at the grown-up teeth underneath that. This is actually a baby mouth. Like you can see grown-up teeth inside a baby's skull. So these guys, these are baby molars, and there's two of them. Now, don't get confused. Baby molars, when they, so far, baby incisors fall out and grown up incisors grow in. And we replace one to one. A baby canine falls out and grown up canines grow in and we replace them one to one. Baby molars fall out. They're not replaced by grown up molars. They're actually replaced by grown up premolars. Why? I do not know why they're called premolars, but they are premolars. And then the grown ups grow molars that never existed in the baby mouth. So all of these white teeth that we just named, including the two baby molars, that's 20 baby teeth all told. When the, premolar, when the baby molars fall out, premolars grow in, which means, you know what, in your grown-up mouth, you probably should have some molars. You know you have them, don't you? And you do. You have actually three molars. Most of us have our third molar pulp. What's that guy called? That's your wisdom tooth, dogs makes you so wise, and most of us have them pulled out, so what does that say about us? Hmm, it says that our mouths are too small to fit all those crazy teeth in there. That's it. What else did I need to tell you about these guys? 
think we're totally good. Okay, now let's talk about our salivary, salivary glands, but first of all, don't forget, teeth? Why do we have to learn all the tooth anatomy? Because our teeth are responsible for the mechanical digestion that takes place in your oral cavity. Shall we look at our salivary glands? Remember, your salivary glands are actually contributing chemicals. Yeah, they contribute fluid. If you tried to chew up a cracker without any saliva in your mouth, yeah, good luck on that. Good luck swallowing it if you did not have any saliva. So saliva uh, serves a lot of functions. It also contains an antibacterial substance, which breaks down bacterial walls. How cool is that? So you're busting up bacteria when you spit all over stuff. Fantastic. So here are my salivary glands. First of all, the big boy. The big boy is called the parotid gland. And please remember that this is just one side. We actually have another parotid gland on the other side. Para, par means next to, ot means ear. So the parotid gland is actually next to your ear. The parotid gland produces about 30% of your saliva. And it, there's one duct that's emptying out of your parotid gland, and you can actually feel it. I, can, I have one. I don't know if I bit my parotid gland opening or what, but this side is, like, massive. And this side, I can find it, but it's not nearly as massive as the other side. One opening. And if you're going to try and find it in your mouth, it's superior, it's on the superior end between your cheek and your maxilla. It's between your cheek and your teeth. And you can reach up there and you can feel it. And you can even feel saliva come out of that thing. Two other sets of salivary glands. You have submandibular glands. Submandibular. Now, I'm going to write the other gland down, and we'll talk about them together. My other gland is sublingual. My sublingual, lingual tongue. Submandibular, below the mandible. The mandible is your lower jaw. So your submandibular gland is going to be closer to your mandible. Even though this is part of your mandible, my brain is like, yeah, I can see submandibular back here. Sublingual is underneath your tongue, and that totally works for me. Look at how much closer the sublingual gland is to your tongue. Now here's the deal. Submandibular is the friend that produces the most saliva. I have to make sure that that's true. Yes, thank you. It produces 65% of your saliva. That's crazy talk. And your sublinguals are only producing about 5% of your saliva. So submandibulars are doing the biggest job. The tricky thing is looking at the ducts. You notice that the parotid gland has one duct that dumps fluid out. Same with submandibular. Look. Here's my submandibular gland, and you can see one duct that comes up and opens just posterior to the incisors. In fact, you have a, a structure, did I say this already, the lingual frenulum. You have the labial frenulum, which is, a, I think you can see, you can see right there, there's my labial frenulum. See that tiny little, dude, I need a pointer. It's like that, you can feel it. It's that little skin thing that connects your lip to your gums. That's your labial frenulum because these are actually your labia of your face. And your lingual frenulum is the same kind of structure. Let's see if you can see this without me salivating all over you. Ah ha ha ha. Your lingual frenulum is underneath your tongue and it's a thing of skin that marks the midline of your tongue and connects your tongue to your, the bottom part of your mouth. 
Did you follow that? So what was the point? The point was submandibular gland has two, no, one on a side, one duct that exits just lateral to the lingual frenulum. Holy moly. So have you ever gleeked before? I'm a gleeking expert because when I was in the rockin' um, sixth grade, some punk slime ball named Zach Munoz, punk Zach Munoz, he used to turn around and gleek all over my desk. And when you gleek, you actually are flexing your submandibular glands. Flexing, you can't flex glandular tissue. You're flexing some kind of muscle or something that activates your submandibular glands to secrete saliva and you can shoot it out far. And you actually can shoot it out on people. And I, I mean, I can vividly remember sitting at my desk and looking at my desk and being like, what the hell? There is spit all over my desk because he would just turn around and like gleek all over my desk. So in true Wendy Riggs form, I proceeded to go out and learn how to gleek so that I could retaliate. And I've actually become quite an excellent gleeker. If you can't gleek, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to gleek all over my computer screen. But you can actually flex your tongue like that and saliva will spit out. And if you're like, uh, yeah, I'm not very good at it, then just eat something sour first. I've got all the skills. I learned all these lessons. That is the submandibular gland. Now, sublingual. Sublingual doesn't produce much saliva, but hold, here it is. See my sublingual gland? Just deep to the tongue, inferior to the tongue. Holy ducks, are you kidding me? There's ducks all along the line. You can't gleek out of your sublingual gland because there's that it doesn't produce enough saliva. You wouldn't get any like forward action. We should have a gleeking contest. Somebody don't remind me that I said that because that's a little bit crazy. All right, let's move on and talk about the pharynx.